Good morning, Brew Daily Show. I'm Neil Fryman. And I'm Toby Howell. On today's pod, the surprising reason why you can't find any salt at South Korean supermarkets these days, and the one thing you can no longer do when visiting the gorilla enclosure at the Toronto Zoo. Then we'll talk about a new program the Federal Reserve is rolling out that is kind of like Venmo for banks, before checking in on Disney World where wait times are low and vibes are lower. Neil, it's Tuesday, July 11th. Let's ride. Neil, today is Tuesday, July 11th, but it's also our 100th episode. Let's get a little cheer for the people in the back. Woo! Neil, give me 100 takeaways from our first 100 episodes. Oh, God. JK, give me one takeaway from our first 100 uh, episodes. One takeaway. Um, I've learned that people have very specific habits in the morning. Interesting. And that they, they sort of listen to Morning Brew Daily while they do these very, you know, daily rituals like walking the dog or going to the gym or have their 20-minute commute. And so if you can put out a podcast that's early enough that where you can be part of someone's morning ritual, then they kind of feel bad about not listening yeah. or doing it as part of their ritual. It's the way they wake up. So that, it's been pretty uh, interesting to hear stories of people being like, you're a part of my morning ritual, we, which consists of brushing my teeth and yeah, doing my I was pot of coffee. Say, we have a brushing my teeth gang who listens to us while brushing their teeth. How fast, so. how, how long are they taking to brush their I teeth? I know. I do want to know like how many like morning walk gang, how many uh, morning workout, how many brush teeth. So sound off in the comments. Yeah. And what's your takeaway? My takeaway is that I cannot say Hyundai. <laughs> we all I, I nailed it right there. I nailed it right there. But in all seriousness, this has truly been an amazing first century of shows. The support we felt from you guys and it has been amazing and the love for the show that you show us has been just truly sensational. It makes me so proud to sit next to Neil every morning and bring you guys the news. With that said, we do have a little something up our sleeve for the next 100 episodes that has to do with rewarding you guys for spreading the good word of MBD. That's all we'll say on it for now, but it rhymes with deferral program. That's all I'll say. All right, Neil, let's jump into our first story. Um, our first story of the day comes from Wall Street, where big banking is finally getting hip with the Venmo crowd and letting us access our money in real time. Later this month, the Fed plans to roll out a new service called FedNow, which gives banks a way to make customer funds available 24-7. That means you don't have to wait till business hours or for the bank to open on Mondays to access your cash. This has been a long time coming, Neil. Other countries like India and Nigeria have had this feature for years now, so the U.S. is actually playing catch-up. But the Fed felt the time was finally right to get on the immediate access train. Let's quickly, quickly run through some of the pros and cons of this move. A pro is that it's huge for customers, especially for those with the lowest incomes who will have faster access to their paychecks, which helps reduce the need for some of those predatory loan services that you always see in those like random strip yeah. malls. But there are cons too, and they are sizable. Remember the bank runs that took down SVB and First Republic earlier this year? Well, now those can potentially happen in real time, anytime. Neil, what do you think do you think the pros outweigh the cons or what do we got going on here? I think Fed it's now? I think it's time. I mean, yeah. you've seen uh, like over 50 other countries uh, adopt this. I remember hanging out with people from Canada and we went to a bar and we were like, hey, do you have Venmo? Because like you owe me money. <laughs> and they were like, no, I actually just have direct <laughs> money payments yeah. linked to my bank account. So that's all I use. I don't need a third party service to send money. Uh, and so it is time. I think there's just regulations that you need to put in place uh, to sort of mitigate some of the cons, which is, like you said, could be to accelerate some of the bank runs that we saw uh, in the spring with SVB. Yeah. But, well, but but part of the reason that SVB also collapsed was because of this antiquated system that we have where they were looking for billions of dollars to save them. And they're in California. It's, you know, 2 or 3 p.m. They call up Bank of New York Mellon in New York. And and they're like, listen, we need $20 billion uh, to save ourselves and we'll be OK if we just get this money. And Bank of New York Mellon is like, 
Uh, yeah, have you looked at the time? It's like 5 or 6 p.m. and we can't do anything because the Fed is closed. Yeah. And so, are you kidding me? We're in 2023. Yeah. That is interesting that it, it's like live by it and die by it a little bit. But the Fed is instituting some safeguards to make sure like a massive instantaneous bank run doesn't happen. And the safeguards are they've built in a $500,000 transaction limit, although you can kind of get around it because you can make multiple $500,000 transfers from different accounts. So I guess you could do more than that at, at one point. But they also give significant leeway for the individual banks participating in this program to set withdrawal limits. So if you're a bank on the smaller side, maybe your transaction limit isn't 500,000, maybe it's closer to like 50,000, because it really is small banks that are at, at the most risk of these big bank runs. So yeah, they've, they've thought it through to a certain extent, and you're right, it's more of them just entering like the modern era yeah. of banking. Money is moving faster, and we should, people listening to this are probably thinking, how is this different than Venmo or mm -hmm. Zelle? Uh, and it is different. It's supposed to be accompaniment to those uh, products and services. Those are not those are called uh, like non bank loops where it's mostly peer to peer payments. So, you know, I you owe me a lot of money, actually, for all our smoothies we get in the morning. <laughs> You're going to use Venmo to send me that money. Uh, meanwhile, the Fed now stuff is not you can't download the Fed Now app, it's going to be made available to banks and you will be able to tap into it through your bank. And it's meant for business, per business things like payroll, uh, but also, you know, consumers can use it for things like paying utility bills or mortgage uh, interest right. payments. And so like bigger, bigger ticket uh, payments that you don't want to like pay on Friday and it won't post until Monday. Yeah. This is big for businesses too, because now the traditional like payroll cycle is over always been like two times every month or something. But now with FedNow, technically they can invoice their mm -hmm. clients quicker and then that transfers that money over to their employees quicker. So we might be seeing like the end of the traditional like two times a month payroll cycle. And it could just be like a weekly thing or even a daily thing, depending on what the, the job is, right. which is big for the cash flow of a lot, a lot of people. Absolutely. And then just quickly to put a bow tie on this, in the background, uh, the U.S. is undergoing some major banking regulations. So the Federal Reserve's top banking regulator, Michael Barr, has kind of laid out a post-SVB landscape for what uh, the capital requirements of these big banks. So it looks like, especially with FedNow rolling out, banks are going to have to hold a little bit more extra cash. Rainy day Just, fund. Yeah, rainy day fund as an extra safeguard because we saw SVB and because we have this instantaneous uh, cash uh, uh, availability um, thing going on right now. So that's chugging along in the background as well, yeah. which is a good... Uh, you need that. <laughs> <laughs> I would. Th I think big banks may uh, disagree with right, that. Right. But um, yes, this thing is going to come over the next couple of years. Don't mm -hmm. expect it to happen right away when it rolls out. It's going to take many years for a bunch of banks to adopt it. But I think they have 57 uh, financial institutions on board when they launch later this month. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. Let's go to South Korea for our next story, where prices of sea salt have soared more than 40 percent since April and shelves on supermarkets are being stripped bare as people panic by salt and other staples like anchovies and seaweed. The reason later this summer, Japan is planning to release treated radioactive water from its Fukushima nuclear plant, which melted down after the tsunami in 2011 into the Pacific Ocean. And there are concerns that this radioactive water will contaminate seafood products. Japan and the UN's nuclear uh, watchdog say it's safe to release the water into the ocean, arguing that it's in line with what other countries do, like the U.S. But there is growing alarm in neighboring countries like South Korea, China, and North Korea that there will be long-term impacts on the environment and the food they eat. It's a very charged political issue. People find this very upset, uh, and they are protesting outside of various government buildings. So why release the water now? Well, Japan wants to fully decommission this plant. And one of the last steps it needs to take is to put this water that is used to cool the reactors somewhere. 
because right now they are running out of space. Japan has already built more than 1,000 stainless steel tanks on the site that store 1.32 million metric tons of wastewater, which is enough to fill 500 Olympic swimming pools. It's ruled out building any more tanks, so it's planning on stripping this water of its radioactive materials and slowly leaking it out into the Pacific Ocean, which it says will be di diluted to the point where it's not unhealthy anymore. It is that thing that you read the headline, you're like, this feels very scary, but then again, it's dripped out over the the course of like decades that they're planning, and it is super diluted. But still, like when you hear sure. the headline, of course you're gonna have some concerns about the environmental effect. I think the secondary effects are super interesting. The fact that salt prices are skyrocketing in the, with this going on in the background, they're up uh, twenty. Uh, let me find this 27% in the first week of June. That's, that's a pretty right. crazy increase from just like this. People are, are a little nervous about, oh, about their salt. They're also, I mean, even if it's not bad for the environment, we can debate that later. I mean, experts seem d divided whether it will actually contaminate seafood products. The fact that consumers are going to be hesitant is going to hurt businesses in general because I read an article about this South Korean fish market where the p the sellers have a radi like a radiative detector. Yeah, and they're going and they're the customers are going up to the. Uh, to the fish and they're like, can you, can you show me that this is clean? And so like, they are going to have to do that for the forthcoming, you know, years right. or decades, who knows, to prove that this fish is fine. And so there's always going to be something in the back of a consumer's mind saying like, is this seafood product okay to eat? Well, you know, South Korea is importing a lot from Japan. This fishing industry has been devastated already from the nuclear meltdown back in 2011. So there's just like increased uh, consumer hesitation around these particular products that no matter what you do, no matter how many times you say it's safe, that everyone's going to be kind of peeved a little bit. Yeah. I mean, South Korea is so against this too. 85% of the South Korean public oppose this plan. And yeah, I would oppose it too if it's not even your decision and that you are being affected by it potentially. So I can see that. One senator from the uh, South Korean government is on a hunger strike right now. He yeah. hasn't eaten for the past 14 days because he's basically saying like, I wonder whether you'd be willing to drink it or use use this as well. How come I'm like you're doing this to us when like w you probably wouldn't uh, accept it in your own drinking water or something like mm. that. So it's definitely like this hot button issue that's only only going to grow because this is it hasn't happening even happened decades. yet. It's going to yeah. happen over decades, and they're gonna they say they can strip out most of the radioactive material except one called tritum. And uh, you know their experts are kind of divided over whether tritum is bad for you or could potentially be bad for you over the long term. Yeah. Uh, you have experts on both sides saying like, it's not a big deal, it's found naturally in humans. And then the other side is like, well, you know, we don't have enough enough research yet to figure out whether we can actually trust that. Tried. So um, yeah, it's definitely a spooky thing. Uh, okay, let's move on. Uh, after hearing this story about Aretha Franklin's estate, I promise you will write your will tonight, no matter how old you are. I just wrote one last night. So here's what's going on. A trial began yesterday over control of the multi-million dollar estate of Aretha Franklin, the music icon who died in 2018 from pancreatic cancer. The reason there's this legal dispute is because she never created a formal will before she passed, and her four sons are battling about how to divide up her millions and future millions. Without a will, it seemed that each of her sons would split the estate evenly, which maybe wasn't exactly what she wanted, but that's how it would be handled since she didn't leave any other instructions. But then, some juicy discoveries. Two handwritten wills, one dated 2010, found in a cabinet in her house, and the other dated 2014, found under a couch cushion. They contradicted each other in some aspects, like who would be the executor of the will and which sons she ordered to take business classes. So some sons favor one of these wills, while another prefers the second. Now these kids have taken each other to court, and the jury will have to decide which will better reflects Aretha's wishes or whether either of them should count as legitimate in the first place. We saw pictures of this 2014 will that was stuffed under a couch cushion, and it does not look like it's going to hold up in court because it's signed, and I'm doing signed in quotation marks, with a smiley face right. and, like, a crossed-out Franklin. So it is interesting. 
because I can see both ways where maybe the more uh, the more recent one, 2014, which was closer to her eventual death, probably maybe reflected what she truly wanted in her will, but it was just done so off the books and like not yeah. officially that it's going to be very hard for it to hold up in court. And then, yeah, you have the 2010 one, which is a little bit more buttoned up. Yeah. But even that was like kind of tucked away in a cabinet oh somewhere. God. So I, I feel you, Aretha, because I it would be scary to have to go down, do estate planning, like set out your will. I know you have to do it, but like... All the estate planning lawyers right now are just <laughs> like so angry at you. I know, yeah. No, you should do it. I mean, her estate is very large, obviously. Right. She's super successful. Uh, it was valued at about 18 million after she died. She has four homes, cars, furs, jewelry, gold records. But I think the most important part is the future royalties because her music's still going to be played uh, a lot. And there's a Jennifer Hudson biopic of right. her coming out. And, you know, she's getting paid, all, Aretha Franklin's getting paid a lot of money for all the music she produced, you know, that it will be continued to be played in the future. So yeah. this is pretty high stakes. But there is a, uh, a tax bill looming too. Yes. Uh, apparently she owed the IRS around eight million dollars and so their the estate will go towards paying that off as well so again it's a very succession-y very i you didn't I, even watch succession i haven't seen succession. for anyone who hasn't seen succession for people who have watched succession you're probably like i recognize this this right. is very similar because uh this the kids found their dad a uh, handwritten note about their dad's succession plans yeah. for the company and they couldn't figure out whether a name was underlined <laughs> or crossed out life imitates art baby that's that's the big takeaway from this story all right, Neil, our next story brings us to my home state of Florida, where the lines at Disney World are at historic lows. Yes, Neil, Disney is borderline desolate. Data from a travel company that tracks line waiting times show that the Independence Day weekend was one of the slowest in nearly a decade. And while that's good for park goers, it is bad for business. Disney execs already said that they expected weaker earnings from its parks division this year, but it's not looking good so far. So what's behind the empty rides in zippy wait times? Well, it's a whole bunch of things. To rattle off a few, there is the adverse political climate Disney is facing as Ron DeSantis continues to wage a war against the mouse. Then there's the adverse actual climate too. Florida is experiencing record temps and thunderstorms in the summer months, which is bad for going to a theme park. Plus there's the sirens call of other travel like going to Europe or going on cruises that is cannibalizing some of Disney's business. Neil, all this to say that Disney is fighting a huge uphill battle to get people in through those turnstiles these days. I went to Disney World in the summer once. Oh, it is, it's a workout. You are sweating. Oh yeah. No, I, I am not surprised by this. You know those fans that have, they blow and they also have the water spritz? That is a lifesaver, Ugh. game changer. I mean, it always pour, you know, it pours at 4 p.m. Yeah. every day. You're and it gets nice out afterwards, but I can't imagine anything worse than going to Disney World right now in July during uh, Independence Day. Sticky. Yeah. Um, but it also, it is part of the strategy that Disney is employing. They have staked out this plan to minimize the amount of visitors that are coming to into Disney World and jacking up prices mm -hmm. uh, to kind of squeeze out more juice or revenue from these people. So they are, they've gotten a lot of complaints because they're starting to charge for things like parking and shuttle buses and things that they didn't used to charge for yeah. that they are now asking people to pay for. And then they have all of these upcharges for skipping lines. I mean, I've never seen anything like this. Yeah. You know, for certain particular, there's a Genie Plus Plus subscription. Oh yeah. Where I you're that's like, the, you're like yeah, I know. I have that's on my you're yeah. like I have that on my front page of my phone. Yeah. Um but no, I I think it's a combination of the the summer and the fact that prices have gotten really really high at Disney World and people are just thinking, well, if I'm going to pay a lot, might as well go to Cinque Terre or something. Right. And I mean, Disney's framing it as it's a better park going experience because yeah, when it's too crowded, no one's really having fun, so they're trying to charge like wealthier people more money yeah. to have a better experience. I can see it. But then also, yeah, the the looming bear of the travel season is definitely Europe this year. I think we've we've talked about it on the show a bunch of times, but there are so many people going to Europe right now. <laughs> Allianz Partners, which is a travel insurance provider, calculated that the number of Americans traveling to Europe this summer is expected to be up by 55% over last year, which was already up 600% from the year prior. What are we doing? 
I don't uh, know. Well, you went to Europe. I did. Go, yeah, I went to to a spot. I'm in the, I, I scrolled on fa- uh, like Facebook and Instagram early, before this show, and I saw at least four yeah. or five pictures of people at Lake Como. And, Everyone's there. Uh, and yeah. Portugal. And people are going to, on cruises too. That's another thing that uh, this Wall Street Journal article cited as potentially cannibalizing some of Disney's business. So cruises in Europe, baby. We've already Ugh. talked about doing a cruise pod, right? Yeah. Let's, let's do a Europe pod. All right, Neil, uh, let's move on. We're back with another edition of Toby's Trends, where I, a studly Gen Z, educate you, a stately millennial, on a new trend I have my eye on. Neil, today's trend is not exactly in my wheelhouse, actually, because it has to do with homeowners, whereas I'm a proud five-by-five-foot box, I mean apartment renter in New York. But the latest trend in home ownership is succumbing to the siren's call of boringness. According to research from an assistant professor at Bucknell University, home renovation has devolved into an overwhelming sea of sameness. The professor calls it market-reflected gaze. People are so afraid to take a risk when remodeling for fear of dropping their home's resale value that they end up creating a home that looks like everything else on the market. And here's the kicker. The researchers specifically called out HGTV as one of the main influences that has created this bland cookie cutter aesthetic. Blame Chip and Joanna, Neil, right? Yeah. I mean, the when you <laughs> when you see these numbers that home comp like ho- housing companies are putting out, it kind of spooks you and you cannot kind of see what's going on. They say that if you have a white kitchen, this is Zillow saying this, it could hurt your home's price by $612. Um, and then if you leave your, if you leave a charcoal gray kitchen, which I guess is the kind, I don't watch the HGTV, but I guess that color is kind of the in style is yeah. in style in these shows, then your home price gets a boost of $2,500. And so you are just conditioned to think about uh, what, what is the next seller going to like? What is the, or what is the next buyer going to like? You know, I want to maximize the value of this property. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, but, but it's super sad because then you don't make it for yourself. Right. I, which is why renting is great. I know. Well, maybe. I can see why there's this anxiety around it though, because yeah, your home is probably the biggest possession, your biggest store of wealth that you have. And if painting your kitchen one car or the other can mean the difference of $3,000, then I could totally see how you are getting so nervous about doing anything. But then, yeah, you see the the article went into and talked to a lot of people that had these regrets about yeah. how they like, oh, I just turned my ho- I turned my house into a hotel. Mm. I was so afraid. Like my realtor kept saying, resell, resell, resell. And then I realized that I didn't like anything in my own home. So That's it's, sad. It, I know it is. It's like a very sad thing. And so hopefully, you know what trend this also pairs nicely with is barbie core, mm. which is we, we spoke about it on a previous show where people are just painting everything hot pink. They're like, screw it. Like I've hated the last 10 years of Millennial home ownership and like we're going hot pink. We're going maximalist. Yeah. So So maybe, you know, the value will be ascribed to, you know, personalization and differentiation going forward. And the pendulum with these things always swings. swings. Never go with like whatever the hot trend is because that will always change. Yeah, exactly. All right. We got to move on to our last story. Um, Humans and gorillas share 98% of our DNA. And it seems that part of the genetic material we have in common is the urge to stare at our phones for hours. The Toronto Zoo is warning visitors against holding their phones up for Nasser, a teenage gorilla at the zoo. Nasser, like most teens, is obsessed with looking at smartphones and has been coming up to the glass of his enclosure to check out what Selena Gomez just posted on Instagram. But zookeepers say visitors showing Nasser their phones is encouraging anti-social behavior. We've heard that before. Yeah. And Nasser spends, <laughs> needs to spend more time with his fellow gorillas learning how to be a gorilla instead of devolving into a lesser species of ape like humans. <laughs> so they put up a sign on Nasser's habitat that tells visitors not to show the gorillas any vo- voters or videos on their phone. <laughs> <laughs> he just like me for real, for real. That's the Ugh. first thing I thought about when, <laughs> when he saw this. This is like a very well-documented uh, trend where there's also another gorilla in Louisville who is obsessed with looking at pictures of female gorillas on people's phones and he does he even does the swiping right? motion so gorillas understand phones they understand like 2d spaces and can recognize themselves so this just makes me like gorillas even more. i love gorillas right they're so smart and and to be fair i think our boy nasser got put on blast a little bit because they went on in the article to say that he's grown out of his phone phase a little bit. He's bonded with his his fellow brother right. in his enclosure. And so it does look like 
he went through his phone. We all do. Like you sit in the basement, you scroll on your phone, you're in your angsty teenage uh, years. But I think he's going to grow out of it into a into a I great think, gorilla. you know, older people are just as addicted <laughs> yeah. to their phones as teens when I go home and I see my parents. He's going to go in his Candy Crush era next. Yeah. All right. That is our show. Uh, it is 7-Eleven. So go get yourself a free Slurpee. But uh, did you know I never get brain freezes? Oh my god! Not once in my life. We're gonna have to put. That I've been to the force test. fed Slurpees. Tomorrow, I never get we're, a brain we're freeze. That, Neil. It's just one of my superpowers. Uh, if you want to send us a note, our email address is morningbrewdaily at morningbrew.com. Huge shout out to our crew who's been with us for a hundred shows now Crazy. and uh, will be with us for a hundred more, hopefully. Um, Emily Milliron is the editor and producer. Samantha Velas and Raymond Liu are the associate producers. Yuchena Waogu is our technical director. Billy Minino is on audio. Hair and makeup is the only person in Disney World right now. Devin Emery is our chief content officer, and our show is a production of Morning Brew. Great show today, Neil. Let's run it back a hundred more times. <laughs>